recording all right so everything is being recorded now all right so did you guys get a chance oh does anyone want me to go over the assignment that was just due in like 30 seconds ago okay but the one that i have may not be the same as yours yeah it's kind of random <laughs> we'll see we'll give it a try All right, so we'll do a preview. All right, so this one is, I think this one is the same for all of them. So I think, I think we're good. All right, so the first question is asking, what is the Cartesian product between x and y? And in this case, x has a, b as the two elements, and then y has one, two, three as the two elements. So the answer is, um, it's going to have a, one, okay. So the way I'm going to work on this is try to be lazy. Okay. Just copy and paste a little bit. Okay, comma, comma, comma. So we'll have one, two, three. So this is one, two, this is three. <clears throat> and then just a bunch of copy and paste. Now I'm pretty sure some of you can write a program to do this faster than I can actually do it by hand. But you get the idea, right? Yeah. Because the first item of each two tuple can be any one of the three. So this is E, and then just copy and paste one more time and change everything to C this time. Okay. Oh, there's no C. Right, okay, so we are done. Thank you. All right. So close, and get rid of E. There we go, six elements. Is that okay? Any questions about this one? No? Okay. So this definitely needs to be graded manually, so you might see a grade or a score that is way below what you think you should be getting. So I do need to go through this by hand. All right, referring to the definitions of the previous question, what is the cardinality? Okay, well, that's six, right? Because we counted the six elements in it. Question number three, referencing the definition of X and Y in the first question, enumerate all sets that can be considered functions using X as a domain and Y as a codomain. So we remember in the previous lecture, either the one on Wednesday or the one on Monday, last Monday, I kind of talked about this a little bit, but using a different example. So um, for this answer, use one line for each set that can be considered a function using x as a domain and y as a codomain. All right, so we'll go ahead and follow the same format. So we have a and b as elements from um, the domain. So we already know the format, what it's going to look like, because a has to map to something, and then b also has to map to something. As to where did, what they map to, it can be anything in the codomain. There's no restriction as to what A and B need to map to, because the question does not say anything about injection or surjection. Well, surjection is not even possible because we've got more elements in the codomain than there are in the domain, but there's, there's no restriction. So you can do this in a very systematic way, or you can just kind of go you know, random. So the more systematic way is to map to one in both cases. And then there are nine of these, okay? So it's gonna take a little bit of time. So one, two, three, and then copy and paste this three times. One, okay, one more time. All right, so there should be nine of them because you know, now we can move on to B, two, three, and then change you know, A to two, two, two. And B maps to 1, 2, and 3 again. And then change A to map to 3 over here. And then change B to map to 1, 2, and also 3. So that's the most systematic way that I can think of you know, to generate the answers to this question. Are there any questions about this one? No questions? All right. Yep. That's not exactly part of it, but I'm just curious if there's a way to generalize how many uh, like, of the sets are going to be functions. Sure. 
So the generalized version is you know, for each element in the domain, it can map to anything in the codomain. So that means you know you have for each element in the domain, you know that's going to be the power that you're looking at, and then the number of elements in the codomain would be the base. You know, so you can look at it that way. Yep. Does that answer the question? Okay. All right. Moving on. Yeah. So let me let me try to use a job point to answer the question because that gives me the ability to use uh, mathematical notation. Give me a second. Let me get job point fired up. There we go. That's from uh, the morning. So let me go back to the class. CIST 440, add a new note. Um, today is 2024, 09 to 3, there we go. Okay. So in our case, okay, you know, I'm just going to re, you know, basically retype the whole thing. So we have X, which is our domain, having AB in it. We have Y as our codomain, which has 1, 2, 3 in it. So the number of functions is going to be, so let me just type this, the number of functions is the uh, cardinality of the codomain raised to the power of the cardinality of the domain. Okay, so I'll type it out because you know, I'm one of those people where I can hear a lot of words and then I will forget everything except for the first three. So this is going to be the cardinality of y raised to the power of the cardinality of x. Let me double check, make sure that thing is all done. So you can focus on just the right hand side, not so much you know, how I type the equation. But does it make sense to you? Because every position of the domain has the, has the cardinality of y as choices. So that means you know you just raise that to, to the power based on the number of elements in the domain. You can also you know, draw this out as a tree. Okay, so if you draw this out as a tree, um, okay, it's harder for me to visualize a tree here. Okay, so you can basically say, okay, what if I choose something from um, x, right? So uh, that's there are only two that I can choose from x. So um, a, okay, A is in X. That's the first one, and the second one is just B. But for, okay, let me, let me double check whether that makes sense or not. Yep, it does. But, A, we choose B. Oh, right. Okay, I, I get it. I know why I'm wondering about this. Because for if you choose A in X, then you can also choose, um, let me see. Right, okay. So for this particular a in x, you can choose, you can, you can determine how it pairs to things in y. So we have three choices here. So basically we can now say we can potentially have a1 in the function. So I'm going to use f to represent the, the function itself. So this is one option. And then we have three options because a can map to 1, 2, or 3. Does that, is that okay? All right. Now, for each one of these choices, <laughs> we can also choose you know, an element in y as, no I, no, I take it back. So now we have to look at b in x. And now we look at how many choices do we have for b. So b has basically the same number of choices because now we can say b1 is in the function f. Just copy and paste it a few times, two, three. 
Is that okay? So this is kind of like a text version of a tree where you decide to, you know, what A is going to map to. Then you can choose what B is going to map to. So I take it back. This one is actually not needed. And then we just have to copy and paste a few times. So there are four lines that I'm copying from here. Paste it here. And then also to paste it here. So that's kind of like a text version of a tree where, you know, we choose, you know, a, what A maps to, which is 1, and then for when A maps to 1, B can map to 1, 2, or 3. When A maps to 2, B can also map to 1, 2, and 3. And then when A maps to 3, B also can map to 1, 2, and 3. Those are all our posts. And that's why there are 9 of them. Is that okay? All right. And that's one of the reasons why you know, CISP 430 is a co-requisite of this class. Because in that class, have they started to talk about trees as a data structure? Not yet? Okay, well, they will. <laughs> Iraj will talk about trees eventually, and, um, but I'm using tree as a tool to visualize your know, choices, okay, How, you know, to do the counting. Are we good so far? All right. So now we go back to the question, moving on to the next one. Okay, based on how X and Y are defined in the earlier question, how many subsets of X Cartesian product with Y are not functions? So now we have to first you know, look at the actual number of subsets of you know, X times Y, or the Cartesian product between X and Y, and then we ask you know, so how many of those are not functions. And I'm not sure, did I skip a question from earlier? No, okay. That's not skipping. What is the cardinality of that? That's six, that is correct. And this one is asking, enumerate all sets that can be considered functions. So that's not skipping either. All right, so one thing that I have not actually talked about here is how many subsets do we have you know, between the Cartesian product of X and Y? Now, whether it is it's a Cartesian product or not does not even matter because we know it has six elements. So the real question is, if I have six elements in a particular set, how many subsets or how many sets are subsets of that six element set? That really is the question. So do you guys remember how to answer that question? Yes. So in this case, it would be 2 to the power of 6, which is 64, right? So 64 minus the ones that we know are functions, which are 9. So that would make what? 55? Yep. So 55 would be the correct answer here. There we go. Cool. Do we have any questions about this? So of the 64 possible subsets, um, only only nine are actual functions, and the the rest, which are fifty five, are not functions. Is that good? All right. So I'm going to submit quiz, <coughs> and I should get a few points. Yep, this one I got a point. That one it has to be manually graded. Yep. So I got five out of nine, and the rest you know, I need to manually grade. All right. So was it helpful? Was the was the homework assignment helpful to kind of make you guys think? Am I understanding these concepts correctly? Okay. Well, then it's doing its job. Excellent. All right. So with that said, we are going back to the concept of Aleph Null. Last time, on Wednesday, we talked about the G function, which is otherwise known as Cantor's mapping function. And the way it was constructed is kind of long, okay, because I was going through the entire explanation of how I derived it. Because when I worked on this material, I did not even know that there's such a name called Cantor's mapping function. When I later on found you know, a discussion of Cantor's mapping function, the rationale of you know, how to work out the actual closed form of the equation was basically the same as what I did. In other words, I just reinvented the wheel. Okay, so this is something I also want to talk about just a little bit, just a little bit. Is re reinventing the wheel such a bad thing? It depends on from whose perspective, okay? 
But from a student's perspective and even for an instructor perspective, reinventing the wheel is not a bad thing because it is not about the wheel. It is about the process of inventing. In other words, okay, if I need, if I have an application that needs the concept of a wheel, instead of looking it up and go like, okay, how does everybody get this done? Okay, and then just copy the solution. And instead, I just imagine that the solution does not even exist yet. And then I go through the whole process to come up with the concept of a wheel, okay? Only to find out that humanity has had this concept for thousands of years. <laughs> but is that still a fruitful or useful process? The end product is not useful because yes, we know about wheels for thousands of years, okay? What is the big deal? The big deal is the process of going through the whole problem solving process and go through that whole thing and go like, oh, okay, I did come up with the same solution, but it is my process that is you know, producing the end result. So from your perspective, it is the process that is more important than the actual end result. Because otherwise, why are you even in the class? Most of the things that I teach you here, you can find it on the internet, and chat GPT you know, can most likely, I cannot say 100%, most likely on technical stuff, out know you any day. In other words, it knows more about technical stuff than you do. Probably as a class as a whole, you will still lose to chat GPT. So it's not about knowing, it's about the process. Anyway, getting back to this. So now we look at this equation here. If you look at xy, which is the coordinate in a two-dimensional space, and each axis is a natural number, then this is going to give you a unique number that you can put on every single cell, and this function is a bijection, which means it is both an injection and a surjection, okay? So we kind of established this last time using a spreadsheet. I hope you guys still remember this thing. Yes, okay. So if you want to go into and find out how each cell gets the values calculated, you can actually just look at the equation here, which is basically just a version of the G function. But I have to take into consideration that a column number starts with one, a row number also starts with one. So I have to kind of compensate for that. But the idea is we just basically sweep, okay? This is the corner. And then we go to these two. And then we go to these three and then we go to these four, and so on and so forth. In other words, we're just sweeping in a diagonal way in order to quote unquote paint each tile with a number. So I hope you guys still kind of vaguely remember that because without reviewing the content, something from five days ago, especially something like this, is very, very easy to forget. Okay, so I hope you guys got the chance to review the material before class. So I claim that this is a bijection, okay? We kind of loosely prove that this is a bijection because it is an injection because no two cells will end up with the same value because every time we paint a cell, we increment a counter. So there's no way two cells you know, can reuse the same natural number. So that's a very loose, not very formal proof that this is an injection. The surjection is basically asking are there any natural numbers that may not be used? The answer is no, because if I keep going like this, okay, just you know, kind of intuitively, we know that we can eventually use whatever natural number you give. I just have to keep painting the tiles you know, diagonally. You just have to do it long enough, and whatever natural number you give me, it will be used. Is that okay? So once again, informal proof, but we can kind of see how this is a bijection. Well, if it is a bijection, that means there has to be an inverse function. In other words, yes? I have a quick question about class one, the paragraph. Yeah. Uh, if you go up a little bit. Yep. The, or, sorry, no, I'm, I'm, oh. the paragraph right above the, right above one more, that, that one where it says uh, the base of the diagonal is the upper left direction, is it the, because isn't it, Okay, so uh, can you name the paragraph, like the first, says, second? Uh, we do know that we're trying to from the okay, the uh, from the base of a diagonal line, which is the uh, lower right-hand corner to the upper left direction. 
That's because the way I drew this is upside down. So imagine this kind of upside down. That's why, you know, okay, so I, I can better say it here. So basically, if I just drew it upside down, this would be 0, 0, right? 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So the whole thing is upside down. I could have made it not upside down, you know, and then just by, you know, subtracting the row number instead of, you know, just using the row number by itself. Yeah, you know, but because I'm just using the row number, this becomes row one instead of row one being down here. So that's a that's a good question. All right. Any other questions about this? No? Okay, all right. So we are moving on to you know, how do we derive the inverse function, which is actually even more fun than deriving the original Cantor's uh, mapping function. All right, so the inverse is interesting because you know, basically what we are asking is I give you a natural number and I want to find out which cell, give me the coordinate of the cell that, con that is mapped to that natural number. That's what I'm asking, okay? So there are ways to do it. I mean, you can always do it using a program code, which means you, know, you keep painting until you until that specific number is used then you can find out which cell is you know basically painted by that natural number that's one way to do it but that algorithm is big o okay i shouldn't say big o it's big theta to you know whatever number you're given with so that's that can take a long time so what i want to do is to get the closed form so that i can mathematically find out you know, which coordinate or what is the cell number that contains a particular value. So to do that, I, first of all, I, this is the presentation of how x, y, and n are related. In this case, n is given to you. In other words, I already what natural number I want to use. I need to find out where it is. In other words, x and y are the ones that I want to find. n is already given to you. Is that okay? Does everybody understand you know, the, the problem that I'm trying to solve? So n can be a huge number, okay? It can be you know, 20 billion and 16, okay? So are you going to keep painting the diagonal lines until you find it? That can take a long time. Definitely not recommended, right? So now the question is, what can we do about this? So the first thing that I noticed, okay, when I was deriving this was, hmm, well, everything, you know, on the same diagonal line, they all at the x and y coordinate of everything in the same diagonal line add up to the same value. So that was an observation that we also talked about on last Wednesday. So let me switch back to the spreadsheet so that we can see that. So I'm going to pick this particular diagonal line and I can use control click to select all the cells that we want to focus on. So you can see how you know, if you add up 4 and 0, you know, here, 3 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 1 plus 3, and 0 plus 4, they all add up to just 4. Okay, so how is that going to help me? Well, I will just go ahead and say, let's first find out which diagonal line we need to look at, and then we'll resolve, you know, which pixel on the diagonal line that we want to, you know, that, that actually is our solution. Is that okay? Okay, all right, so let's just say that that makes sense, okay? We just want to find which diagonal line first. So the next diagonal line is going to be this one, right? So we already know how the base of each diagonal line relate to each other. In other words, we know how this relates to this, how this relates to this, and so on. We already have a closed form equation to calculate that. So switching back, oh, not here, switching back to the notes here, so if I say that W is X plus Y, in other words, W identifies the diagonal line, okay? And all I want is to find out which diagonal line contains the pixel that I'm really looking for. I can set up this inequality. So we'll go ahead and kind of pause here a little bit and see if there are any questions about, this will give me W, which is the 
if I number that, the, if I number the diagonal lines from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, this will help me find the diagonal line itself. Does that make sense to you? We good here? All right. So we know that g of w0 is going to be w times w plus 1, the whole thing divided by 2, because there's no y component. The y component is a 0. So w times w plus 1 divided by 2 plus w plus 0. Might as well just not write here plus 0, OK? But we know that the pixel that we want is on this diagonal line, too. So that means you know, n is the upper bound of this particular number. Are we doing OK so far with that concept? Shall I give you an example? OK, so let's pick a number. Um, Let's not make it too big because I want it to be, you know, on the actual spreadsheet that we can see. So, what number is good for you? It applies. No, we don't. We don't know what is x and y, but we know, you know, the upper bound of the. We want to find a diagonal line first, because once we find a diagonal line, it's very easy for us to find out how many steps we need to go on that line in order to get to the pixel that we need. So let's start with a number, let's say 33, okay? How does that sound? 33. So n is 33. We want to find out which cell has the value of 33. So we, if I use this approach, okay, so let me go back to here. So we'll put a bar here so that we know this is just one section of the class note today. And then you know, the, the, the horizontal line separates you from the homework you know, stuff. So we know that g of, okay, so use the equation here, g of xy is 33. This is given to you. And my job is to find out what is x and what is y. Is that okay? All right. So I am going to say that you know, let's go find out you know, what is the diagonal line. You know, what which diagonal which diagonal line contains the x and y. So now I'm using this notation here. W is basically just x plus y. Okay. But I don't know what is x. I don't know what is y. Okay. I'm just defining that W is x plus y. Is that okay? So that's just a definition. I'm not resolving anything right here. Yep. W identifies the diagonal line. Okay, so when we're at the very corner here, that's, di di that's yeah, diagonal line zero. So, and then this is one, two, three, four, and so on. Is that okay? So coincidentally, you know, that is also giving me the option of saying, okay, if I just want to resolve you know, the base of the diagonal line of W, I know how to solve this already because of the equation of W of G. So this is basically the fraction of, uh, on top we have W times W plus one, and then the whole thing divided by two because that's how we define the g function. When y is a zero, well, I mean, technically, if you want to, we can do a plus zero, plus zero, but it doesn't really change anything, right? But we know this has to be less than or equal to the number that we are given with, which in this case is 33. Is that part okay? Because this is actually the, the, the whole crux of how we can find the solution is we know everything along this diagonal line is going to have a natural number that is less than, or I take it back, um, the base of the diagonal line is going to have a natural number that is less than 33. Now, exactly what it is, I don't know yet, but that's what I'm trying to solve. Okay, so we want the largest W that is a natural number that still re re fits this requirement. Because otherwise you can go like, oh, I can find the solution, easy peasy, w equals to zero. Yes, but is that the largest w that can satisfy this requirement? The answer is no. 
what if w is 1? If w is 1, then 1 plus 0 is 1, which is also less than or equal to 33, but that's help, not helping you either. So you can use a loop, right, you know, to try out and find out which w is the largest value so that w times w plus 1, the whole thing divided by 2, is still less than or equal to 33. You can do it by loop. But every time you use a loop like this to find a solution, that solution is not efficient anymore because you're not using a closed form mathematical equation. Sometimes we don't have a choice, but in this case, we do have a choice, okay? So what we do, okay, if I go back to the notes, is I turn this into a quadratic inequality because you know, this was what we started off with, and by the way, n equals to 33 in our specific example. So now if, if I do it like this, then we have a quadratic inequality. So normally we have a quadratic equation, this is an inequality, but it works the same way. So in the end, what we have is w squared plus w minus 2n is less than or equal to zero. Is that okay? Does everybody understand how these four steps or three steps work? Okay. So now we go like, okay, let's just ignore that this is an inequality. We'll just pretend that it is a equality. So if we pretend this is an equality, we can just plug it in to the quadratic equation, okay, and solve for the two roots. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. So to solve for the two roots, one is useless, okay? Because you know, the thing, the one about minus one, minus the square root of blah, 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 divided by two, that root is useless to us because we know that w is the sum of x and y. x is a natural number, y is a natural number. The sum of two natural numbers have to, has to be a natural number. So that means anything that's negative is not gonna be useful. So we're gonna be focused on you know, what if on the non-negative root, okay? So the non-negative root, if you just kind of work out all this math here, it becomes this thing here. This is a floor symbol. Now, the reason why we need, why we need to take the floor is because this is actually a inequality and we need the w to be a natural number. So that's why we are taking the floor of the non-negative root to solve the quadratic equation. Are we still doing okay, kind of following the reason? I mean, the, the actual derivation is just a little tedious, okay? So don't focus on the actual derivation, but focus on the concept, okay? So once we have this, okay, we can now solve for w, okay? So we're gonna solve for w in this case for 33. So let's see, we have 33 plus one, eight times 33 plus one. So eight times 33 is 264, okay? 264 plus one is 267. The square root of that is 15 something, I think. Because 16 will give you 256. And what was the three times 30? Okay, I have to track this. 16.7, hmm? 16 16.7, okay. So let's call it 16, you know, 16 minus one is 15, and then 15 divided by two is 7.5, so, which is seven, okay? So this, so the whole thing boils down to seven. Let me just double check on, on the math here. Okay, I can, I can do my math using a command line tool. Okay, let me find a useful prompt here. There we go. All right. BC is a, a command line calculator. You can specify the scale, which is the number of digits to the right of a decimal point. Five is much more than what we need, okay? So what we need is um, eight times 33 plus one. And so this whole thing, the square root is going to be uh, 16 point something, okay? So 16 point something minus one would be 15 point something. 15 point something divided by two is going to be seven point something. And the floor of seven point something is just going to be seven. Is that okay? So we know W is seven. So now what? Well, then we plug it back in, okay? 
So we'll plug it back in and we go to job plan for this because we can basically just kind of say we solved for that already. So in this case, W is seven. W is seven. So now we know what natural number is at the base of the diagonal line, okay? So now we can say at the base, um, G of seven, zero is seven times six, the whole thing divided by, two, no, seven times eight, sorry, seven times eight, the whole thing divided by two is seven times four, which is 28. All right, I'm gonna pause here. Are, we, are you guys still with me? <laughs> All right, so let me go back to the picture, okay? Because I think the spreadsheet is gonna help us visualize this. So when we go back to the spreadsheet, we found out that this is the base of the diagonal line. In other words, okay, let me just control click the whole diagonal line. This diagonal line somewhere <coughs> is the pixel that I want. I mean, you guys can already see it, okay, because we can kind of eyeball the whole thing. But what we just solved so far is I have identified the entire diagonal line. It is diagonal line seven, okay? Uh, you mean the, the job, job plan? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So the whole thing is still being recorded, I hope. Oh yeah. <laughs> but I, I have to double check because sometimes I forget to click a button. Yep, it's still being being recorded. All right, cool. But you guys are definitely welcome to take a picture. Just make sure that I'm not in the picture. Because I don't want to break your camera. <laughs> Somehow tech, text space has a fractal pattern. And then when you encode it into PNG, you know, it just breaks your phone. That would be quite a feat to do, right? If, you, if I could figure out you know, how to tattoo like a QR code on my forehead that would break your know, Android or iOS cell phone. <laughs> That's Android. Yep. Yep. There are only two types of cell phones now, Android or iOS. If it's not an Apple, it is an Android. We used to have a um, Blackberry. Yep. Yeah, that was a painful end to that company. Anyway, okay. So we now know the base, okay? So once we know the base, okay, all we have to do is to do a subtraction to find out how far do we have to go from the base of the diagonal line to get to the pixel that we want? So all we have to do now is to say n minus 27, okay, with, okay, 33 minus, I don't know, you can type, minus 28 is five, okay? So this is the value of the y. Yep. I'm sorry, how do you get the 28? I got the 28 because 28 is the natural number at the base of the entire diagonal oh, line. Huh? You just plugged it in? Yeah, I plugged it in. Okay. Yep. And we know that we have to take five steps from the beginning, from the base of the diagonal line. So that means y has to be five. Because how many steps we go on the diagonal line determines the y coordinate. Okay? So once we know the y, the x is super easy to figure out because we know that w is x plus y, which means x is w minus y, which in this case is w is 7, 7 minus 5 is 2. Okay. So now we know the solution is, okay, so I'm going to write the solution here. So the g inverse applied to the natural number 33 is the two tuple where x equals to two and y equals to five. All right, well, let's double check, okay? Because this is just my calculation. So we go back to the spreadsheet. There we go. We go like 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, and it is indeed at coordinate two, five. Is that okay? 
So reading the notes you know, is a little bit heavy duty because there's a lot of equation and formulae and symbols and stuff like that. But what I just did in class is an application of how that works. So hopefully the example in class is helping you a little bit in terms of understanding the derivations. Okay, so getting back to the abstract portion. So once I figure out how this works, then all I need to do is to put the whole thing together. And basically, instead of using w as just a constant, w becomes a function on its own. So this is how I turn w into a function that relies on n so that I can rely on it. So now you know, once I go through all the calculations using just a lot of algebra, then I know the x coordinate is going to be this portion. The y coordinate is going to be this portion when I need to find out the coordinate of the cell that is painted by a natural number n in this case. Is that okay? All right. <laughs> yep, that's a lot of math. So what is the bottom line, okay? The bottom line is kind of interesting because at this point, we know that G is a bijection, okay? Because even though we kind of informally prove that G is a bijection, now that we have find the inverse function of G, yeah, I think we are pretty sure that G is a bijection. What is kind of cool is we have now established this, okay? So we'll, we'll focus on this equality here. And we'll do it one, so one part at a time. N is the set of all natural numbers. This becomes the you know, this becomes the Cartesian product between two natural number sets. This is the cardinality. In other words, we are looking at quote unquote how many things are there in this you know, uh, Cartesian product between natural number and natural number. We just established that it is exactly the same as the number of elements in the set of natural. Because you know, even though it doesn't seem to make sense to make that statement, we know why it works. Because we found a bijection between the between this particular Cartesian product and the set of natural number. As long as we can find a bijection that can do this, we can say that they have the same cardinality. That is the whole point of Aleph No. Aleph no is only the first one. There's Aleph no one, Aleph two, and so on and so forth. In other words, there are symbols to represent the cardinality of sets that have an infinite number of elements. Is that okay so far? Yes? What set has a cardinality of Aleph one? Aleph one is the set of real numbers. Uh -huh. Yeah. In other words, in quotes, okay, air quotes. There are more real numbers than there are natural numbers. But in terms of two-dimensional or any known dimensional space, the, you know, they have the same number as there are natural numbers, which is kind of interesting because if you think about it, it doesn't seem to make sense and yet it works, right? Okay, so now we take a look at this and go like, let, let's look at how absurd this really is. Okay, because we are basically saying that, oh, we can fold a two-dimensional space into a one-dimensional space. Okay, what about a three-dimensional space? Well, it's like origami. You fold two of the three dimensions into one dimension first, then you have only two dimensions left, then you fold those two dimensions into one. In other words, you just need the nested application of Cantor's mapping function then you can fold three dimensions into one. What about four? Well, just fold it one more time. <laughs> In other words, if you already know the number of dimensions, then you can always fold that space of natural numbers into a one-dimensional natural number space. Isn't that kind of fun? All right. So we're going to take row right now. Okay, so let me see, make sure my... Row taking activity is still in time. I think it is, okay, because I, today is 2024, 0923. You guys cannot see it yet. So. 
I'm going to unhide it. You should be able to see it now. And then the access code is SDF1, which stands for Super Dimensional Fortress 1. I mentioned that from, uh, I think, last week. Because the way it travels through vast distances is by folding space, which is kind of what we're doing. <laughs> So I'll let you guys, you know, kind of input this. <clears throat> I think it's a Japanese anime from 1984 or 82, I cannot remember. I think it's 82. I was in high school. <laughs> you guys are, I, I think you guys are doing all the math right now. It's like, oh, Tech is older than my dad. I probably am older than your dad. <laughs> all right. So let me just kind of, you know, kind of write down you know, what I mean by that, okay? So basically, you know, if you want to fold, okay, so let's say we want H, okay, H is a function that maps from math dBn times <laughs> math dBn times math dBn, and we close paren, right arrow to just math db. Oops. Here, pb n. Okay, so in other words, if I need to find a bijection, you know, to map the three-dimensional space of natural number to one-dimensional space of natural number, if I, if I need to find one bijection like this, all I need to do, I actually get a few options, okay? I'll let you guys figure out how many options I have. One option, okay, I'll emphasize one option is to define h as h of x, y, z, because we are looking at three, a three tuple, you know, because it's a three dimensional space. So we, we can basically say this g of, um, no, let me, let me take a slightly systematic way to do this. This is just one way to do it, not the only way, it's one way. Is that okay? So basically what I do is with a three-dimensional three coordinate, I take the x and the, the y and the z, apply g function to it first. So this comes back as a natural number. Then I combine that natural number with x and then apply g to that one also. So when this is all done, it's going to give me a natural number. Is that okay? But this is only one of the options. The question is, how many options do you think I have? Okay, so there are, there are a few ways to think to figure this out. Okay, so one way to figure this out is to just go by the all the permutations of x, y, z. Okay. So with x, y, and z, how many ways can I reorder those things where ordering is important? So that means so x, y, z, x, y, z is one, and then x, and z, y is different because you know, ordering is important here. So the question is how many ways can I rearrange x, y, z? So I'm counting the number of permutations in this case. Hmm? Nope. Six. Six is correct. Because, you know, okay, so the way we, we reason this out is for the first element, I have three choices. But once I have chosen the first one, the second place, the second position only has two choices because I cannot repeat. But once I have, once I have chosen the first and the second choice, then I really have no choice because there are only three things available. So the third one, there's only one choice. 
So it's three times two times one, which in this case is six. So I can enumerate all six here. So I have exhausted everything that can start with x. Now we have to start with y. I have exhausted everything that can start with y now. Uh, you can focus on the, uh, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> so this time I start with x, z, sorry. I start with z, x, y, and then z, y, x. So those are the six ways of arranging those. But within each one, I can put the nesting you know, of the second two. I can also put the nesting around the first two. So, so for each one of these options, I have two additional options. So there are exactly 12 ways to make use of Cantor's mapping function to create a three-dimensional mapping thing back to a single dimension. All 12 will work just as well, okay? Because each one is a bijection, so I don't, it, doesn't really, it doesn't really matter which one I'm using. This is, one, this is just an example of the 12. Is that okay? So one thing that is kind of interesting about this is if you know the, the, um, the number of dimensions that we are talking about, you can transmit one single natural number and then the other side can decode it into a three-dimensional coordinate. Instead of transmitting three individual coordinates, you can transmit one single natural number, and then we can apply the inverse function in order to decipher and then get all the individual, co individual x, y, and z back. Is that okay? So theoretically, you know, it is kind of interesting, but practically it is useless because the integers become so large or the natural number becomes so, so large so quickly that it's not really saving you any bits, okay? So it's not saving you any transmission cost, you know, by doing it this way. Is that okay so far? All right. So that pretty much marks the end of the all of no discussion. And I have not uploaded the next one to um, GitHub yet, but that's okay. You know, we don't always need to use GitHub because I'm just changing the format, you know, to use GitHub. So we are pretty much done with you know Aleph No, and then the next um, item that we need to talk about is relations. But before I start on relations, do we have any questions regarding the Aleph No module? The Aleph. I'm not going to put Aleph No into this exam, so it's going to go into the next one, because we have not, you know, done a homework assignment, you know, yet on this one. I may not even, you know, have a homework assignment on Aleph No, but you know, I'm going to put it onto the next exam. So for the exam on next Wednesday, it will cover everything up to and including um, injection, surjection, and bijections, but excluding Aleph No. Yes. I would love to do that, um, but so far, you know, all of no is a harder, you know, discussion to have homework assignments for. So I'm gonna have to think about how to make that happen. Probably a chat GPT thing. Let's see. Let me take a look at the current one and see whether it already has. Oh, it does have AI generated questions. So I would try these out first. <laughs> I think these are all verified as well. So I manually have to go through the answers and verify those. So I would start with these 10 questions, okay? Um, and I specifically asked um, Chat and GBT so that it, it would use um, the HTML elements. Uh, one is called a summary and the other one is called details. And that's how it can create, you know, like a drop down like this. It's pretty cool. Um, and if you click on this, it goes to the chat and GPT conversation. So I basically uploaded you know, the entire module and then I gave you the prompt. Let me go all the way back to the top here. Um, so my prompt is based on the uploaded content, which is the actual markdown content. Um, please generate 10 questions and their corresponding answers. 
to test my understanding of the concepts as well as my ability to apply these concepts. So the way you write the prompt is really important because you don't want this to only test your knowledge because you also want these questions to be able to test your ability to apply the concepts. Um, it does a fairly good job. I was actually surprised how well this turns out. In the output, use, ex use HTML details and summary elements so I can click and display the answer only after I have come up with my own answer. So it's basically just giving Chat and GPD the extra parameters you know, to control what the output should look like. You can probably do the same you know, with your other classes too, um, because it worked surprisingly well. I was actually really surprised by you know how Chat and GPT can understand the material that we have been talking about in this class. In assembly language programming, it doesn't do nearly as well when it comes to bitwise operations. But for this class, you know, all the logical operations, set notations and whatnot, it did a pretty good job with coming up with you know, sample questions. All right. So this is, I think this is a great resource. Even if you don't pay for chat and GPT, you can still give it a certain number of prompts you know, per hour or something like that. Does anyone know for sure? No? Three or four per hour? Per day. But you guys can pull together, right? You make your, I know you guys already have a Discord you know, server for this class. So all you need is to make sure that you know, we just kind of cycle through you know, different computers because I think this go by, uh, usually go by IP address or does it go by IP address or does it go by the cookie? The account? Oh, okay. That's easy enough. You can, <laughs> you can, you can write a bot to sign up for multiple email addresses, and then. <laughs> I see. <laughs> it's twenty bucks per month, and the fact that you know, this class has no textbook that you have to purchase, that's what you know four months times 20 or five months at the most, a hundred bucks. Okay, so if you think about your other classes, okay, you know, how many of your other classes require a textbook that's cost you about a hundred bucks per semester? I don't know, I mean, I have not been using textbooks for a long time. All right, cool. So go ahead and check this out, okay, yeah, because I want you to actually see what kind of questions AI can generate that can help you study for classes, not just this one, but also for your other classes. All right, so if there are no questions, I'm gonna move on to talk about relations. Okay. Do we have any questions before I move on? Nope, okay. So we'll move on to talk about relations, and this one is still using the older format, which works okay, okay, but eventually I want to move everything onto GitHub. All right, so the question is, what is a relation, okay? Well, there are two answers to this question. One is mechanically what makes a relation a relation. The second one is what is the purpose of the whole concept of a relation? So in practicality, the relation that is useful to us, okay, so I'm gonna use the Joplin again. So a relation is an example. Okay, so let me say an example of a relation is less than or equal to defined over, we'll just say integer. Okay, so over math. There we go. So this is an example of a relation. You're just less than or equal to. So you go like, um, so what is the big deal? We all know what is less than or equal to already. Well, we know what is less than or equal to applied to integers and real numbers and so on. But do we know how to define less than or equal to in other contexts? So I'm, I'm going to give you guys a context that many of you are familiar with, okay? So let's just say that I'm running a game server of some kind, okay? And I need to find, you know, quote unquote, gamer of the week, every week. So I can highlight you know, one of the gamers and go like, okay, this is the gamer of the week and you know, 
we're gonna give this gamer like you know freebies and swag and whatnot. Okay, is that okay? So now the question is, how do you select you know the gamer of the week? Well, you need some kind of comparison, right? So let's just say that your 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 user base is like twenty million worldwide. Of the twenty million gamers, okay, who is going to be the gamer of the week? Okay, so what what kind of metric do you want to use, you know, to integrate into this consideration? So you need criteria, right? You know, so most gaming company would use how much money did this person spend as at least one of the criteria? Yes, okay, because you know we we would we want to encourage people to spend more money, buy more skins, okay. <laughs> Even though it doesn't does not do a single thing, but this one looks like me. This is my favorite color. I want to buy it, okay. So we can use that as one of the criteria. What what other criteria do 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 you think is is applicable? When you want to find, or when you want to define the gamer of the week, come on, you guys are gamers. You don't have to hide that from me. Skills. Okay, skills. Okay, so we are looking at your know, kill ratio, right? Your know, kill, what is that? K. KDR. KDR. Your know, kill, yeah. kill death ratio. Okay, so okay, that's one. What what else? Hmm. DPS per week. Okay, you know. Damage per per, per second. Okay, okay. You guys are still forgetting some of the most important aspect of being a good gamer, the I social know, aspect. Of, yeah. What what is that? Time spent. Time spent. Okay. Now that one is okay. evil. That one is definitely evil. <laughs> because you know that's that's the reason why you're not studying for this class. Damn it. Okay. Okay, what else? You're still forgetting you know, the social aspect of games. Okay, when, at the end of a game, you know, depending on which game, a lot of times they let you rank or rate your teammates, right? Who's the most friendly, who's the most helpful, you know, and so on. Okay, so you have those ranking too. So now you have to come up with a way to combine all of this, right? So you have to basically in C++ code, okay, you are going to overload the less than or equal to operator, so they can compare two gamer objects. Is that okay? So you define a class, huge class, you know that represents a particular gamer, okay? And then in it, you have plenty of attributes and methods and whatnot, okay? And then you define the less than or equal to operator, so it can decide, you know, whether a particular gamer is less than or equal to the other gamer when it comes to you know, being selected. As gamer of the week, is that okay? So now we suddenly go like, oh, okay. So we are not defining less than or equal to over the set of integers anymore. We are defining over a much larger space, okay? Because KDR is one axis, okay? Um, um, DPM DPS is another axis, okay? Ranking in terms of friendliness is another axis. How much money a person spends in a week is yet another axis. So you're looking at a huge space. So how do you order? How do you determine whether someone is less um, of a gamer of the week than the next person? So you go like, oh, I can define conditional statements. You know, if this person spends at least this much money and blah blah blah. Okay, yes, you can do all kinds of stuff like that. But the question is. Are you ending up with a relation that is totally ordered? What do you mean by totally ordered? I mean, can we sort? In other words, whatever less than or equal to operator that you have just defined, can we use it in a sorting algorithm? So, like, how, how, why would that be a problem? I mean, how can less than or equal to not be usable in a sorting algorithm? That's kind of what we're getting into for this chapter. Okay, so we're going to define what is totally ordered, what is partially ordered, but those require another discussion of you know, some other attributes of relations. Okay, that's the motivation for this class to talk about relations. So I want to give this you know, kind of background of why this topic can be important to you. Is that okay?
So for those of you who are saying, okay, I'm really not a gamer, that's fine, okay? We, we want to find the employee of the month, okay? You're working for HR department, you want to find the employee of the month, okay? Same, same issue, right? You have a lot of app metrics, you have a lot of numbers. How do you define that function? And make sure that you can have a totally ordered relation so that you know, no one's going to complain, you know, what do you mean by I'm not as good as that person? <laughs> because that's what you're going to end up with when you have a relation that is not totally ordered. Is there are individuals where each one is not less than or equal to the other one. So you cannot really define who is the best. All right? So that's the motivation. So now, the first thing, technically now, okay, you know, we just talked about the rationale behind why we want to understand relations. Technically, it's easy, okay? A relation is a subset of the Cartesian product between two sets, basically the same set and itself. In other words, we are trying to relate elements of X with other elements of X. We pick two elements from X and we say, are these two related? That's basically what we are asking. Is that okay? All right. But because this is a Cartesian product, it also means you know, uh, A relating to B does not mean that B is, relate, is relating to A because it's directional. Is that part okay? Kind of like less than or equal to. You know, if A is less than or equal to B, it does not necessarily mean that B is less than or equal to A. So that's kind of the, the essence here. And then we also have a shorthand. The shorthand is basically to say XRY is basically saying XY as a two tuple is in R. And R is, is, is a subset of the Cartesian product between X and X. Okay, so I have a concrete example here, but then we also have a random example. So let's take a look at the random example. So we define X to be A, B, C, D. In other words, these are the things that we want to find out you know, who, which one is related to whom, okay? And R is just by some random number generator defined as A, 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 B, B, C, D, D, and B, A. What does that mean? Well, all it means is A and A are related. So that means you know, a, an element can relate to itself. The easiest way to think about this is less than or equal to. If you think of any integer, okay, five. Is five less than or equal to five? Yes, okay, so that means you know, an element can relate to itself. A relates to B using R, B relates to C using R, D relates to itself again, and then D relates to A. So you can see A, B, and B, A are two separate items. Okay, so in this particular case, a relates to B, and B also relates to A. But when you look at BC, B relates to C, but C does not relate to B, because it's directional. Are we good so far? All right. So to answer, you know, to, to look at the notation here, ARB is true because AB as a two tuple is a part of R. This is just a notation. It means exactly the same thing, as AB as a two tuple is in R, okay? It's just a shorthand. BC as an element is in R is also true because we see it over here. BRB is false because we don't see BB anywhere in this set. DC as an element is in R is also false because we do not see DC as a two tuple in R. Are we doing okay so far you know, in terms of just the nomenclature? You know, the symbols, how we utilize you know, A, R, B as a shorthand because it just makes things a lot shorter. We good? Okay, all right. So we're going to move on to all the good stuff now. Reflexive. So this is the definition of what it means to be reflexive. A relation R defined over a set X is said to be reflexive if and only if the following is true. For every E in X, E, E is in R. Okay, well, examples. 
All right, so I'm going to give you guys some kind of extreme examples, okay? The first thing I need to do is to define what x is, okay? So in this case, I'm defining x to be an empty set, okay? So if, it, if I define x to be an empty set, what is the only r I can define for it? Because remember, r has to be in, r has to be a subset of x and x Cartesian product. So in this case, what is your only choice of r? An empty set. Yep. So my question is, is r reflexive? So right off the bat, I'm really asking, do you guys remember your quantifiers? It is reflexive, okay? It is reflexive because the definition, there's a for all here, right? So a for all is a gigantic conjunction of things. So what is the default value of the conjunction? It's true, exactly. So it's basically true and blah, blah, blah. Okay, all that blah, blah, blah depends on, in this case, the elements of x. But since x is an empty set, we don't have the blah, blah, blah. We only have the default value of true, which is also known as the identity of conjunction. Okay? So that means, really kind of in a weird way, you know, from a certain perspective, this r is actually reflexive, even though it's empty. It is reflexive, okay? All right, so more examples. All right, so this time I'm gonna change x to be something else. So we'll make it a kind of like a minimal, okay? It has one single element of a. And then we, oops, I forgot. This has to be an asterisk here. Ah, there we go. So now we defined r to be just an empty set. So the question now is this R reflexive? Let me go back and give me the answer here. This one is true. Okay. What about this one? Is this R reflexive? And how do we know it's not? Yep, exactly. Because AA is not in R. So that's why it is not reflexive. The answer is it is false. So this entire discussion up to this point is basically, I mean, relation is a very simple concept, okay? You know, but the quantifiers that I use here to define what is reflexive is basically a test of whether you guys understand the quantifier of the universal quantifier in this case. So everything goes back to notation. This class really is a lot of notations. Are we good? All right. So um, if this one is not reflexive, what is reflexive? In this case, we only got a choice, right? This one is reflexive. So let me just scroll up a little bit here. There we go. Are we good so far? Yes? Okay. So now let's you know, make, it, make it even more fun. You know, kind of toss a few more things into the whole mix. So this time, x has a and b. In other words, I have two elements um, of which I want to define a relation r. So we'll go ahead and you know, define r as, I mean, if it's an empty set, you guys know it's not going to be reflexive already. So we'll start with something that is clearly reflexive, like that. Okay, that is certainly reflexive because A relates to A, B relates to B, we are good. Okay, every element in X relates to itself. All right, so this one is good, it's easy. So I'm going to throw a wrench in here and say, ah, in addition to those, to those two, I also throw in A, B in it. So now the question is, is this reflexive? Yeah. It is reflexive because A, B has nothing to do with whether something is reflexive or not. It all has to do with the quantified expression is clearly stating 
oh, I'm just focusing on whether an element relates to itself, whether the whether an element relates to something else has absolutely nothing to do with whether a relation is reflexive or not. Is that okay? All right. Cool. So reflexivity, reflexive, being reflexive is the easiest one to define. I got five more minutes. So I'm going to move on to this one here. Okay. So this one is called symmetric. A relation R over a set X is said to be symmetric if and only if the following is true. This is what I'm saying is true. Okay. So the first question is this. Okay. So let me, I'm going to change the size of the window a little bit just so they can see the definition and also see you know, the rest of the um, Joplin screen. So I am, yeah. In fact, I need to go back here because I want to ask a second question here. Is this R symmetric? And I'm going to erase the answer first so that we can focus on it. Oops, I didn't pay. <laughs> so question is, is this R reflexive? X is an empty set. R is an empty set. Is this particular R reflexive? This is the definition of you know, what it means to be reflexive. For every way to choose two elements, okay, they don't have to be the different, they don't have to be different, they can be the same. So for every way to choose two elements of X, EF is in R if and only if FE is in R. Do I even care? Do I even care what is in the parentheses here? When R, when X is empty and R is also empty. It does not even matter because each loop, okay, because every time you see for all, it is representing a loop, okay? So this time we're looking at a double loop because we need an outer loop to find an element for E. We need an inner loop to find an element for F. So we're looking at a double loop. But both of the loops, okay, are empty because there's nothing in X. So when the loop has nothing to do, the default value is true. So that means I don't even need to know what is inside here. The default answer here is yes, it is true. Okay. So now in this, in the second case, um, let's try to figure this out. Okay. So we still got two minutes, right? So now the question is, is, okay, is this particular R uh, symmetric? Question. There we go. Is it symmetric? But R is empty, so why is it symmetric? Well, we don't want this one to be always true. It can be false, that's okay. It's just that when this is false, I also want this to be false. Is that okay? And vice versa. So we can see that R is an empty set, and there are there's only one, one thing to evaluate, because E has to be A, F also has to be A, because A is the only element in X. Okay, so the whole thing becomes is AA is in R if and only if AA is in R. In this case, we can see that, oh, AA is not in R, which means AA as a two tuple is in R is false. But that's okay, because it's false on the left-hand side of the if and only if, but it's also false on the right-hand side of the if and only if. So if both sides of if and only if are false, what's happening to the value of the if and only if? It is true. That's right. So we are good. Okay. This one is actually symmetric. Is that okay? So we got about 30 seconds, 15. <laughs> so we're going to take a look at this one. Okay. Is this one, okay, let me just highlight so that you can, I can show you which one I'm looking at here. Is this symmetric? It is symmetric. What about this one? This one is not symmetric. It is not symmetric because A, B is in R is true, but B, A is in R is false. So that means one side of the if and only if is true, the other side is false, then the if and only if is false. Okay. All right, so I'm going to pause here on Wednesday, two days later. I will start to talk about 
well, I will use the entire class period to talk about the exam one from last semester. So my advice is you guys try to answer all of those questions as much as you can, okay? And then if you cannot understand any part of it, or if you have any questions, or if you go like, okay, I'm not sure about this one, then bring those questions to the class so when I go over the answers, you guys can ask me and go like, okay, but what about this, okay? What if I do something like this to the question? So those are probably the best use of class time on Wednesday. So I see you guys on Wednesday. Have a good uh, two days before we meet again. You mean the recording or the... Oh, the Joplin? Yeah, I can post it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sure. Let me stop the recorder first. Um, I'll just find the...